Space Talks with Z is hosted by America's Future Series great friend and advisor, Zahir Ali. Space Talks with Z provides a forum for thought leaders to share insights and recommendations on how America and its allies can stay at the forefront of exploration, commercialization, and defense of space. Please visit our website to register to see all of Z's content and our many other programs for free at www.americas-fs.org. Welcome, folks, to the first episode of Space Talks with Z for 2024. Happy New Year. Hope you all had a good uh, holiday season. Uh, today, we have with us uh, Deepak Seth and Robbie Zari, both experts uh, in uh, AI. Uh, they're business leaders, uh, IT leaders. Uh, they've done some really interesting things that we're going to jump into uh, in our talk. But briefly, uh, welcome, Deepak. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's a real pleasure, you know, your background, uh, both in, in financial technology and consulting is really interesting. Xerox, Censure, Charles Schwab. Um, it's going to be fun jumping into the business perspective um, of AI with you. Robbie, thank you again for joining us. Robbie Zari, CEO of Positon. Uh, he has an extensive experience, uh, started out as uh, an engineer, um, uh, did that for several years, uh, consulting strategy, many years in corp corporate development. Uh, every you know, at companies ranging from Fortune uh, 50 all the way through uh, small companies and startups. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. And what what you know, what a what a start off to the year uh, we've already had. Um, AI is in the news. I think hourly. Um, things dropped in 2023 with GPT, but uh, but it feels like. Feels like now we're really, really hitting the ground um, running here. Um, so, start jumping in. You know, let's take a quick look at where we are, what the state of things is, really quick. Let's baseline, um, and particularly as we look at AI and business. Uh, I think the question in a lot of people's minds is, where is AI making inroads in business? Um, and but what are the risks and challenges of implementation? Um, we, we're hearing a lot of stuff in the news. How much of it is noise? How much of it is actual stuff that's that's happening and is going to really make a difference? Um, maybe we can ask you to jump in first, Deepa. Hey, uh, first of all, thanks, Zahir. It's a, it's always a wonderful opportunity to speak with you, and I'm glad we can we are doing that right at the outset of 2024. Uh, yes, you're right. Means uh, AI has been a very, very interesting uh, space for sure over the last uh, last year. Uh, generative AI in particular, and that's why that that this backdrop of mine makes sense. Because there was a lot of it was a it was a mystery to many over the course of last year, and that's why I started to blog about uh, what I called AI demystified. And I'm sure this conversation will also be one more step in this demystification of AI. Um, as you as you as you mentioned, means AI is making inroads in in several uh, several areas. Traditional AI had already been in uh, in industry in a major way, but now with generative AI, there are uh, there are some specific areas in which it has made great inroads. Uh, the first one is around uh, customer service and marketing. Uh, second one is around uh, operations and supply chain. Uh, third is around in the whole media and entertainment space. Uh, then also in finance and banking and and healthcare means uh, media and entertainment. We all saw it play out when the two major strikes for both the screenwriters and uh, actors guild. One of the key uh, areas of concern was that for them was around the what role generative AI can play. Similarly, in media and journalism means we see a lot of copywriting and other stuff which is happening uh, using using generative AI. In most companies in the customer service space. Uh, where you require, where there is a human interaction with the customer and the human needs to refer to a lot of internal policies and documents in order to respond to the customer, a lot of the work can, can be facilitated uh, by AI. So that's, uh, that's another area where it is, where it is playing an uh, important uh, role. Um, uh, quickly, uh, means you mentioned uh, you had a second part of the question around what the areas of concern around it are. Uh, means the areas of concern stay, stay the same, which had been right from its outset. Uh, they are around, first of all, around is around misinformation and deep fakes. Uh, means uh, companies still need to deal with that. And then the other big concern is around job displacement and bias. And as we go further, I think we'll we'll speak through these. But I'll um, uh, 
I'll toss the ball back to you now <laughs> because I can go on and on. Oh, no, fair enough. Uh, but really interesting points uh, talking about the marketing. Uh, an example of that um, content and media was um, a major video game house recently admitted that they're using generative AI um, and actually replace, uh, augmenting or in some cases replacing some of their artists. But let me toss it to you, Robbie. You know, from from that business, you know, core enterprise level business perspective, well, what do you see as where we are? and yeah. what the risks and challenges uh, are going to be. Yeah, well, first, uh, thanks for having me uh, on this show. Um, I, I kind of want to step back a little bit and uh, and describe um, how enterprise kind of looks at AI, because I think there is a, um, a general understanding of generative AI that's out there in the public. But um, if you look at AI from as a journey, there is a there are companies that are looking at building their own bespoke models right, that they have to actually start from scratch and build with the data sets that they have. And uh, those AI models, they, there's a lot of interest in enterprise level that uh, that makes sense to create something that is kind of, uh, uh, I don't like to call it a digital transformation. It's actually a next evolution in, to, to, that, to that aspect. Um, there is also, um, you know, uh, AI that lives within large data centers or AI that lives just outside of that data center, like they call it um, uh, near edge. Um, and then there's a far edge, which AI that it gets deployed in um, remote areas like um, oil rigging or, or some other remote areas like that. So how do you actually deploy that capability to that extent? So uh, a lot of these problems uh, depending on uh, the industry and the vertical um, um, uh, are far more interesting to the enterprise uh, level. I think there is a commercial level uh, to the user, like a you know a general general use cases of like OpenAI as an example, you know that or a ChatGPT, I should say, um, where the public can interact with uh, some of these. Uh, Kind of summarization or um, a, a little bit of some use cases that we all like everybody's kind of uh, use them at this point. Um, I think there's um, uh, there's also the uh, the aspect of uh, object detection or imaging things like that. So if you go to healthcare, um, there are use cases in that uh, that that are very bespoke to that vertical, and it create it brings up. Uh, issues of data protection, HIPAA, things like that. So those problems are being taken care of. There's frameworks for those AI models that are uh, specific to that industry to allow for you know sharing insights on a federated uh, stand, uh, um, in a federated, a federated federated way, so that uh, the data remains in uh, healthcare providers and it's not. Um, um, it, you know, it, it's not uh, leaving the custody of that um, healthcare provider. So I can go on into mm -hmm. different verticals where AI can be looked at differently based on the stakeholder that's actually using it. Um, but uh, in general, I think uh, um, the uh, the output um, that we're seeing right now has to be. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of in the middle, if you will, like in the middle of that journey where yeah. we're seeing things, but we're also improving on how we actually create that that insight in a responsible way. Mm -hmm. The insight that comes out of it, we want to make sure that the, the data goes in, is protected, and enterprise is also playing with that and making sure that all of that stuff is ring-fenced. Um, but uh, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done to make that transparent uh, through the open source community and, and what have you. So there's a lot of aspects here that we can dive into, but uh, we're pretty sure we'll double click on some of this stuff as we go. Uh, so, uh, so if, if you if I may, Zaheer, just a quick, yeah, please. quick point here. So Ravi, you brought, brought up some great stuff. Um, typically means the interesting part is like AI is operating uh, across a wide quant continuum, so as to say. On one side, you have the cloud uh, where you have big players, um, 
deploying capabilities which reside on the cloud uh, kind of thing, the large language models which are residing on the cloud. You have the Amazon bedrocks of the world and I mean similarly from uh, Google and Microsoft and all, and all the players. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have now capabilities coming out, which are um, which uh, micro LLMs, which can be embedded within your smartphone or smartwatch. smartwatch. So you have got the cloud and the edge continuum means uh, uh, that's one play. And then the other play is around the other axis. If you look at it, it is it is the large models versus the small. So you have the cloud versus edge in terms of the uh, tech stack, and you have got the large LLMs versus micro LLMs on the size of the LLMs. You have more customized um, LLMs which are targeted or focused accord, uh, for a particular sector per se. So rather than boiling the ocean, you have a specific one focused just on finance or just on healthcare right. and, and things like that. So, yeah. so the narrow, the narrow, uh, it's that conversation that we had even with um, machine learning and things like that. You have the large models and you have the narrow models. So mm. that's so, so. you're saying that's happening with LLM. But I, I want to go back to a couple of things you guys said. Um, uh, um, so the, I think the question, the next question everybody has is, you know, what's next? Some of this stuff has sounded a little bit like low hanging fruit. Okay. You can throw an LLM to go read a bunch of documents and give you, uh, and then give you a Some summary. Mm -hmm. Um, that's great. Um, we can certainly deploy that at scale, but, but it, it's a little, a little easy in terms of how you think about what, where you're going to apply this. Um, but you know, like Robbie, in your background, you deploying working on on you know ai and and high performance compute you know when we think about ai is it the same as other it waves uh, you mentioned that you don't like to think of this as digital transformation because it's something bigger than that you know mm -hmm. I, I i i think that's really interesting um how does that now how do we now think about that and how do we think about deriving value in the business sense um, is it is it something we hand over to the to the IT guys and let them drive it, or do we drive it from from the application side? So for me, that uh, if you want to look way into the future, I think there's a couple of things here that are going to be really interesting to watch. It's one is uh, one of them is uh, having HPC or high performance compute that support um, the development of these models go onto a cloud. So just the same way servers went to the cloud, we're going to have um, that application of HPC onto the cloud, which means it's going to un uh, unlock an explosion of um, experimentation and building these models because it's super expensive to build uh, the infrastructure to actually uh, build the, uh, uh, train those models, right? So first, you, you know, you have to have the data set, training, uh, you have to have the right accelerators, chipset, and also um, having uh, the inference part of, of, of that uh, journey. So HPC on the cloud, I think, is going to unlock a lot of that. Um, and you can see a lot of partnerships going on uh, at, in, at, the, at the moment in the industry. But also, uh, there's another aspect that, um, that we need to talk about, which is um, the use of AI in, in quantum. Right. So as quantum is developing, the use of AI in actually uh, in the simulations or simula or figuring out a, a way to actually code quantum, right, and develop the 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 algorithms for for quantum, which is you know uh, uh, that's an issue of its own, right, that we're trying to solve for the industry. Right. Quantum problem. advantage algorithms. Exactly. So so I think there's that continuum that's happening into like if we talk about that future. I think those probably the one of the major things and we don't know. I mean, I probably can't even imagine what opportunities and solutions and and things that are gonna be amazing for the for humanity as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, that that those uh, those two tracks will bring um, powered by AI. So uh, means if if I were to continue the same chain of thought since you since you brought up the word powered and there was this whole uh, thing about power which was playing in my head as you were as you were speaking was. Uh, so the human brain compared to AI means it, it does what it does with a very, very limited power consumption. It like it consumes 25 watts of power is what, what the human brain does. And so one, one key area in which AI needs to evolve is getting is becoming more energy efficient because for what it does right now, it consumes a lot of lot of energy, consumes a lot of resources. 
So sooner or later down the road, when we talk about way in the future, uh, the efficiency of AI, the resource efficiency of AI needs to improve. And maybe there's an opportunity for leveraging uh, the way the human brain works. Because right now, at some aspect, it is being mimicked, but it is not being mimicked in the terms of the way the neurons actually process the information in the brain or neural computing or something like which actually takes uh, uh, human cells, brain cells, and uses that in, in, in building AI capabilities. It seems like out of science fiction right now, um, but uh, in terms of energy efficiency, uh, the human brain is much, much more efficient and so there and a lot of redundancy in it. So there, there may be opportunities to utilize the, the re redundancy in human brains across the entire globe uh, to drive some kind of uh, human augmented AI kind of thing. So that's that's way far out. I mean, it's even beyond quantum computing, but I just I thought I'll, I'll throw, it, throw it out there. Yeah. No, that's uh, yeah. so. So, so that's that. We're 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 going kind of looking into pretty far into the future. Yeah. Um, now near. Bring, but 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 circling back <laughs> a little bit, right? You know, in twenty twenty four, we we've started off the year with some interesting news, right? Google cutting some jobs, AI is being cited as part of the reason. Um, we're hearing a lot of that. Um, but there's also the promise that AI is going to create jobs in other ways. How how do we see the a lot of these applications that people are talking about playing out um, beyond just uh, automating um, automating kind of boring tasks? Um, how are how how is that that human machine interface going to be creative? Um, whereas right now it seems like it's a great cost cutting measure um, and and you get a lot of ROI from different um, basic deployments. Um, but but looking forward, how are we going to really use this to to the, the way the internet and e-commerce at, at first it was like, oh okay, there's all the destruction that's happening because it, it, it's re removing communication barriers so all the people in that chain are, are necessary. but then at it, it changed but then the curve kind of changed its concavity. Right. And and it became this massive creative force over the last 20 years and has driven world economies. What how how does that play out with AI? Um uh jump in. Okay, so yeah, I mean, that's a that's a that's a great question. And I think that is giving many, many, many people sleepless, uh, sleepless nights. Um so uh that this question came up in another interview I was in and, and I responded in a way which I've heard other people also respond, which is like um AI is not going to take away people's jobs. It is people who know AI who will take away the jobs of or, or displace the jobs or tasks of people who don't know AI, which was the same with Excel, which was the same with the internet, with with, with every different, uh, different thing. Um, so uh, there was this interesting report from the World Economic Forum, which had like classified mm -hmm. the new roles which are being created by AI in three, three different buckets. So one they had called the trainers or, or the builders. The second they called explainers or ambassadors. And the third they called sustainers or AI custodians. Now, if we look at, uh, at all these three buckets, means the changes which will, which will come about in, in 2020, in, in, in the very near future, uh, when we look at the trainer, uh, trainer kind of role, which are the AI builders, uh, it's the stuff which we talked about already, like the cloud versus edge, uh, micro LLMs versus large LLMs. So a lot of uh, technical expertise required to build that kind of stuff. So many, many roles will be will be created uh, created in that space. A lot of traction will happen in the second bucket, which I talked about, which was the explainers or the AI ambassadors, which are the people who are creating the user interface uh, by which the companies or individuals interact with AI. So that's the space where we where we are seeing a lot of democratization happening because AI is making technologies and tools accessible to many more uh, people. Um, AI is emerging as co-pilots. So co-pilots are being created by various companies given very, various brand names. GitHub has some uh, one, Salesforce has one, Oracle has one. Means everything the what we used to do uh, regularly, now we will do in an AI assisted way. So a lot of roles are being created around that. And it is unleashing new new kind of creativity because I, I'm not a good painter, but now using AI, I can say, okay, this is my idea. Can you create an image with that? And now that image can be used mm -hmm. in 
promoting sales or creating a visualization about the future for a uh, for uh, somebody else i'm interacting with so that's uh, that's another area and the third one around uh, i said the sustainers or the ai custodians I mean that's an area which is which is in big play because these are the people who will create the rules and regulations uh, around the world of AI. Uh, so a lot of things happening there around what is responsible AI, what are the government, what are the ethics of AI. So the roles are emerging in companies like AI ethicist or responsible AI manager or even in a broader sense chief AI officer. So I means those kinds of uh, roles are emerging. So it's a, it's a it's a it's an environment in flux, but exciting times ahead for sure. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. I mean, that, that's a really great framework um, mm. to to help people understand um, that 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 builder, user, maintainer, mm. uh, and it's interesting how how that branches out in, in, into a, a lot of roles. Um, Robbie, what are you seeing from 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 your side uh, of, of this? Looking again, you know, that matrix to enterprise uh, view, uh, right. particularly things like corporate development or, or other functions. No, I, I, I totally agree with the, uh, the categorization here from Deepak. And I think, I think as it continues, it's going to have, uh, uh, AI is going to be that, um, um, uh, that, uh, it, it, from a buddy system, right? Like if you think of a buddy system, that's your, uh, buddy that helps you in whatever function you can think of, uh, within a corporation, within an enterprise. But if you fast forward, um, I do believe that AI is going to unlock a lot of creativity um, and unlock a lot of entrepreneurship um, going forward. A lot of folks with uh, ideas that they want to implement now that you can think of AI as, as a workforce across all the work streams that you need to put in place a, uh, a startup, for example. And as uh, things develop uh, and get more robust, um, those capabilities are going to get stronger and stronger. If you take this into, for example, um, with Positon AI, we're looking at uh, automating the M&A process. Um, we use AI responsibly to take care of a lot of uh, use cases that are uh, very, like what we call the, the mundane within the M&A process. Stuff that uh, right now... Um, you know, uh, if you look at a lot of the M and A teams, they they do about 80, 100 hours a, a week, and that's no that's exact. Rough. Yeah, that's rough. rough. So, uh, so AI can help with a lot of the stuff that they don't need to do on a repeatable ba uh, uh, basis, and also some intelligence that can help uh, with predictive uh, analytics in you know real time. You know, we were talking about um, like the other day. I was demoing a. Um, a DCF model to uh, a colleague of mine, and uh, and it was just mind blowing. You can uh, you know uh, how uh, how it was. We're talking about a few seconds, and he was developing a full blown DCF. Yeah, model. That's nuts. Yeah, and you can do sensitivity testing on that and things like that. So, and this is just what I call V one. You know, this is just version one of what we're seeing. And as time goes by, and this is not going to. It's not a linear. Um, uh, Kind of evolution here it's going to be exponential so we're going to hit a point where um and a lot of people are waiting for that agi but i think it's uh, uh it, to be version one but i think we're already <laughs> we're already there we're already seeing flavors of what it can do but i think the promise for me um is is the benefits it brings to humanity from you know all the like healthcare. care like, think of all the stuff that complex problems that we're, uh, we need to solve and we're not able to solve today. AI, quantum, all of this stuff is gonna bring humanity to a new level. And I cannot uh, fathom or describe, uh, cause that's a million dollar question. Like I can't think of what that looks like to be honest with you. Like that future is, uh, it, it's gonna unlock and a lot of creativity from humanity is gonna come out and with the help of uh, AI and the infrastructure behind it, I think it's going to unlock a lot of these um, uh, wonderful solutions and benefits for 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 us all. So, so looking at that future, right? That there are different ways to think about it, right? People people realize now that industry research, in many ways, is is back, right? Um, you think about open AI. They've done something right. GPT did not come from a university, 
right? Mm -hmm. When you think about the internet, that came out of DARPA and Berkeley and Stanford and CERN at Geneva, right? It was academic and government. Mm. Open AI is, is really the opposite completely, right? Initially, if I remember correctly, it was a nonprofit, right? Um, so it's it completely in, in, in coming from the other angle at this. Mm. Um, and now you see they're like mushrooms. They're just, you know, and it, it rains and they pop up everywhere, right? And that's what the start AI startups are doing right now. How do we see this ecosystem evolving? Is it is it going to be, you know, are, are the sharks in the water and they're just going to be snapping up all the little fish, the, the, the you know, the, the, the NVIDIAs, the Intels, the Microsofts, the Amazons? Or or is this going to really create an, an, another ecosystem um, more similar to the way that that the web de developed, right, where, where you have giants that come out of this development and this startup ecosystem? Yeah, I, I can I can start with that. I think mm. it's uh, I think to me, I think there's two two areas there to, to look at in terms of value, right? So there's folks that uh, provide services and value, right? That That is based on AI. So whatever they whatever they provide, it has to have some sort of value and services. Uh, and you can it can be powered by AI. So I think there's that aspect of, of the- yeah, That's of kind the, of one bin. One bin. And then you have uh, the other bin, which is, uh, you know, what we call in industry, like folks that are selling the shovels, right? <laughs> so you've got the NVIDIAs and the accelerators and all that, which is important, right? You want uh, that infrastructure in place, the systems that are optimized for all the different types and flavors of AI, like Deepak was explaining earlier, which is the, you know, the cloud or the data center or the edge or far edge. There is needs and, and infrastructure for each one of them and to optimize for the best use to make it actually commercially viable, right? So a lot of folks right now, for, for example, they can't, uh, it's it's uh, it, to build an AI model, it takes a lot of money. And you can you know look at a lot of the companies that came out and you see how much they raise. Yeah. That's how much it takes to actually build that. So there's that track. Um, um, and I think, uh, you know, if you dive deep into each each of the bins, uh, there's different uh, you know um, div different value that can be extracted in terms of you know uh, from a financial perspective without diving into uh, the financial metrics there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, interestingly, the cost of building an LLM is also is coming down rapidly. So now newer right. companies are are doing it with much much less cost. Um, Another interesting point around this, uh, in, uh, around your uh, Xavier question, is around uh, how the whole paradigm need, is is shifting or needs to shift. It is around uh, till now because uh, AI has come out as you were describing. It has come out from the tech world kind of thing, and so a lot of techy involvement in it. And so it is it is in terms of describing what AI is. So right. it, oh, AI is this LLM. It is LVM. It is uh, um, RAG. It is uh, uh, human in whatever loop, alphabet what soup, right? Is, whatever it is, acronyms out there. But it has to move from that, and every technology does that. It moves from being what it is to what it can do. So right now means when you drive in a car, means you are not thinking about the multiple explosions which are happening in a confined space to drive your car yeah. forward and all that kind of thing. What you are just interested in, what speed does it drive at? Does it get you from point A to point B kind of thing? So the conversation will shift from the techie side to the business side. And what would happen because of that is uh, there will be a lot of focus on the niche applications which are directly relevant for the, that particular industry. Um, so right now means a healthcare sector company may only be interested in what is relevant to the healthcare sector rather than the broader chat GPT uh, uh, kind, uh, kind of thing. And much of what we are thinking about as discrete components or tools of AI, they will become table stakes. They are embedded in whatever we are doing. Uh, so we don't think about when we when we switch on our light bulb in our home or whatever, right. we are not thinking about how electricity is generated. So it's like similarly means AI will become intrinsic to what humans do and um, it will be table stakes. Our kids won't even uh, think about, uh, means it, it is something which augments what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, that's, that's that's interesting. But so then, tactically, um, right? Ta if you think about this tactically, right? You had Microsoft, which was a a computer software company. You had Apple, 
they glommed onto the internet and leveraged it for massive growth and continued growth, right? Mm -hmm. Right. They'd been growing double digits. They continued that using the internet. And then you had companies like Amazon, um, Spotify, and others that were wholly based on the premise of the internet. Without the internet, they just couldn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. So when when will that when do we see that happening? Are we at that point, right? Are there already candidates like, hey, this is an AI company that doesn't exist without AI, but they are developing a complete new, you know, massive enterprise based off of the existence of AI versus now an Amazon is now in the role of 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 the old Microsoft, where they're the ones who who are there's their shovel sellers, right? They're they're that big big player that that is enabling. Where do we see that? Do we do we see those companies yet, or are they are they the ones that are going to be founded in 24, 25, 26 that are going to you know create that next drive over the next ten years? This wouldn't uh, and I'm uh, you, you that's a very interesting question and uh, so isn't open AI a company like means uh, you, whether you call it a company or not that that's the kind of thing who's who's built the built the whole ecosystem kind of thing and then. Other players are emerging who will. Uh, uh, so, so maybe means I'm when I when I'm thinking about it, maybe it would be something like the whole uh, uh, Amazon created an environment where other play other startups are building right. their technologies and then deploying it. Uh, so Amazon is the host and the others are playing in that ecosystem and coming out with their own capabilities. Uh, so right now, Chat GPT allows people the ability to create your own micro micro right. Chat GPTs. Now each one of them could be something, um, a Zahir GPT, and then Zahir GPT becomes a, a big. It resides in that marketplace. Uh, the marketplace owner gets a share of the revenues, and uh, Zahir GP, GPT gets a uh, gets the prime share of the revenue. So maybe maybe uh, maybe that's the that's the kind of model which will which will emerge. Um, and then again, the experts will emerge who will who will be advising people on which which, which one, one to use, which one to use, uh, kind of thing. So in that way, means it is like deja vu all over again, uh, kind of thing. The the nature of the technology changes, but the way humans interact with it will will stay the same. Means in terms of making the choices of of what to pick. Uh, the only thing I think one big change thing which would change is the speed with which the new variants or the mm. new uh, new thing. So means when this thing came about, companies were evaluating Chat GPT versus Bard, and then it became Chat GPT versus Bard versus Claude, then Chat GPT versus Bard versus Claude versus Mistral. Well, then then yeah, yeah, yeah. And and now, the now, names Gemini, keep coming. Now Gemini Gemini has come about, and then okay, LLMs, LLMs plus LVMs. Now LLMs plus LVMs plus multimodal. So the it becomes much more difficult for for the industry participants to decide. But I think they'll follow the classic approach of, okay, let's find a trusted vendor partner, whichever one of the big three, big four, or whatever their appetite or risk appetite is, or uh, means that suit their corporate profile. And they will look at that vendor to provide them all the capabilities which they which they need. So they may make, they may make some sacrifices because uh, Microsoft may have something which Google doesn't have and Google may have something which an Amazon doesn't have. But as right. a as a as an industry player, you'll have to make make those choices and 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 do the uh, the kind of uh, b balance and pick out which one you want to go with. Yeah, very yeah. Good. Yeah, Let's I, go, I, I was just gonna say I completely agree, and I think um, I think what's interesting uh, with the question, um, there's a lot of uh, startups right now that uh, you, you can argue uh, they wouldn't be around without AI, right? So I think that's core to what they do. And without it, it's kind of their internet, right? So to your point, and wonderful solutions out there, really amazing value that they add on top and they use AI in a responsible way. So there's a, a number of them out there, uh, amazing right now as we speak. And I think it's this is a, a trend that's ha that will permeate um, other parts of the market, small uh, medium businesses that in, like allows them to uh, bringing capability into into their businesses, mid market as well, enterprise companies, it's a competitive advantage. If you're not implementing AI within your corporation, you will be eventually you'll be left behind, in a, in a way, right? So I think there's a uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, capability that you cannot afford not to integrate into your system or into your um, into your core capability within any organization. 
And you look at all across all the industries, everybody uh, across all industries exploring how do we bring AI in. So I think um, I think eventually uh, we're all companies. Uh, AI is going to be in all companies, just much like internet is in all companies today. We're going to talk about digital transformation, which is essentially taking companies from offline to online. Right. right? Yeah. So, that, that was the first the early waves. The early waves. <laughs> and now we're talking about AI. How do we um, bring that capability in house so we can enhance our core competency and capabilities? And better value to the customer. Eventually, that's the ultimately that's what it, AI is for. Mm -hmm. you know, how do we bring value to um, to the stakeholders? And one one more thing which I would add add to the mix is like we we talked about the business applications. We talked about the big players uh, building the building the capabilities, and then the uh, the corporate using it. There's another uh, associated sector where where there'll be a lot of play would be like the people who are building the niche tools associated with this ecosystem or the or the plumbing related to that so you are you're sending the data over to a place and you're worried about the security related to that and all the all that kind of stuff so right now the big players are busy in building the in the models they may not be paying as much attention to this uh, like little little associated pieces so there would be players who emerge and come out with those tools and sooner or later means uh, means like it has happened in the past they may get acquired by the bigger players and their capabilities will become part of the big, bigger ecosystem or one of these niche players establishes a strong role for itself as saying okay I, we are the uh, uh, ai data security guys so means whichever whichever platform you are using the the pipeline we we will make your make the pipeline secure right. kind of thing. So those kind of uh, players will also also emerge. Now, whether this whether they stay independent or they get acquired by the one of the big players, I mean that 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 thing will keep on happening. Well, gents, you know we're coming up on time. Mm. This has been really fascinating. I just want to recap a few things that that jumped out at me. Um, you know, Deepak, thank you for for helping us understand that framework of of how mm. AI is going to end up being creative um, with the with the creators. The users um, and the and and the sustainers mm -hmm. um, and rule makers structure. Um, you know, Robbie, I think it was really important to highlight how how AI is going to be a co-pilot, um, like the example you gave with Positon with corporate development. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we uh, like to do here uh, on Space Docs with Z, you know, in the America's Future series, is is ask for uh, predictions and recommendations, or or uh, and and feel free to be prescriptive. So I'd really love to. Just, you know, your top three for 2024, either, you know, it could be a mix of, of this is what you need to do and this is what is is likely to happen. Maybe I could toss it to you, at you first, Deepak. So, yeah, it means I'll, I, I'm a big one for uh, structured models kind of thing. So I'll go go with the people process and technology framework. So on a people people side means if you are as an individual, you need to upskill yourself and stay in touch with whatever is happening in the AI space. Um, maybe get some AI certifications, figure out a, a tool and, and learn more about it. At least every every person would need to be, if not AI expert, at least AI aware. So right. uh, means that that goes across roles. From a process point of view means it would be uh, companies trying to figure out how to make AI a part of their normal business processes. Um, because uh, where can AI fit into the into the mix of what they do? So identifying the use cases and bringing bringing it in and on the technology uh, uh, side of it means once again the uh, evaluation of the various technologies which are coming up and trying to figure out which one is the right one for the for the corporation uh, making sure that it delivers value for the corporation means rather than it just being a science experiment it needs to be the one which drives business value for the company and its stakeholders so a lot of action will happen in that direction like show me the money it means okay yeah. we, it's not just the nice to do, but like what's the what's the uh, ROI with with that particular thing? So people will be will need to be ready, ready, ready to do that. So yeah, that's uh, that's my three on the people process and technology. People process and technology, yeah. love it. Thank you. The, another interesting framework, Robbie. Please uh, bring us home. Yeah, I think I think adoption um, with adoption of enterprise mid markets SMB of AI is going to increase. And I think with that, there's going to be a lot, there needs to be a lot of training on how to actually use it internally from a data security protection standpoint, 
we'll hear stories. We've heard mm -hmm. stories before, mm -hmm. but there's uh, the it's it has to be part of the ecosystem, part of the package, right? So you're not um, you want to um, you you want companies to adopt early so they're not left behind, but at the same time you don't want to um, you know create additional risk for the company as you know internal and external. Right. So I think I think that aspect um, and to what Deepak mentioned, it's all about the ROI. Right. At the end of the day, you want to make sure that the companies are going to look at this um, uh, where it actually adds value um, and and experiment with this. And I, you know, I would like to predict as much as I can, but a lot of things, a lot of the what we're going to find out in 2024 is a lot of experimentation. Because I mean, there are companies that are leading and in integrating AI, but not, I mean, if you look at the whole market, they're still adopting, and it's still we're still in that phase of uh, of ramping the adoption. So I think we're we're gonna find out a lot from uh, 2024. It's gonna be a year to uh, learn from for sure. Awesome, yeah, exciting yeah. times for sure. A year to learn from. I love it. We've got people, process, and technology as as a framework to keep in our minds, and then you know, dare I say, Robbie adopting and even creating a culture of AI within companies. Um, that's that's a fascinating point. There's a lot to unpack there. Perhaps we'll do this again in, in a couple months uh, and even take stock of what's happened in Q1. Um, but for now, uh, I give you, you know, gentlemen, uh, many, many thanks for joining us. Deepak, thank you. Robbie, thank you again. Uh, and we'll uh, provide uh, links to uh, both uh, gentlemen's uh, LinkedIn profiles, uh, their companies, etc. Um, as we put, you know, at, uh, below uh, of this video, and please look out for continuing space talks with Z throughout the rest of 2024. Uh, and let's make it a great and productive year. Take care. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.